Council here in Geneva titled The State of Fundamental Freedoms um, in Tibet, a discussion ahead of China's Universal Periodic uh, Review. Uh, we would first like to thank the Helsinki Foundation for Human Rights for organizing this event. Uh, this event is also co-sponsored by the FIDH and the International Service for Human Rights, uh, which the organization that I belong to. My name is Rafael Viana David, uh, and I lead ISDRO's work on China. I'm very pleased to be moderating uh, today's discussion with esteemed panelists that uh, have been working for, for a long time now. And before starting our event, I would just like to recall an important fact that uh, ought to be recalled very often, which is that no instance of course of intimidation or reprisal will be tolerated during this event against any of the speakers or civil society um, participants that are in the room with us today, either in the form of oral interventions or through unauthorized pictures or otherwise. And in that regard, I do want to note that the only person that is authorized to take pictures and record during this event is my colleague Elise. You can raise your hand so everybody recognizes her. Um, and if you'd not like to be photographed, of course, please kindly um, indicate it uh, to her. For today's event, I'm, I'm honored to count on the presence of uh, a diverse pool of, of experienced activists that either come from or um, are in support of the Tibetan people and community. And I warn you all that coming on this occasion, Kai Mula, uh, on behalf of the Haitian Foundation for Human Rights and International Campaign for Tibet, um, Gloria Montgomery uh, from the Tibet Justice Center and coordinator of Tibet Advocacy Coalition, and Pema Doma, the Executive Director of Students for a Free Tibet. So thank you, and thank you for, for being here, and particularly you, Pema, that you've, you've flown just yesterday. Um, I will turn a few moments to our panelists for their interventions, um, and we'll then have a time for, for a round of questions um, and conclude our events with some, some um, closing remarks. Uh, we'll have enough time I, I trust for, for questions and interaction with the, with the audience here um, on this important topic that unfortunately very often gets uh, invisibilized um, at the UN. But perhaps uh, just uh, to open and, and kickstart this discussion, and of course in an increasingly hyper-nationalist um, China under the uh, Xi Jinping's leadership, linguistic, religious, cultural differences, um, that is those varying from Han Chinese majority are growingly perceived as a threat to social stability and hence to political stability um, of the Chinese Communist Party and therefore in the eyes of the leadership as a question of national security. Practicing a distinct uh, religion daily or um, seeking to be educated in your mother tongue even when you already speak Mandarin and transmitting key cultural practices to your children, um, these run against the expectations of course that the party state has for its population. Um, so instead of building a, a society where, where, where different peoples are able to fully enjoy their, you know, um, cultural, linguistic, and religious autonomy and rights, um, the leadership has embarked on a role of, of assimilation uh, to the majority, and, uh, and uh, which is, of course, Chinese Han culture, and to an unwavering support um, to, the, to the party as the only possible identity for a citizen on, in the PRC. Of course, this also happens um, in the context of uh, the UN system tackling this issue much more uh, strongly, if I can say, over in particular over the, since the beginning of this year, coming both from UN special rapporteurs and from UN treaty bodies. Um, so just in August this year, um, three experts of, um, sought clarification on the fate of nine imprisoned Tibetan human rights defenders. Earlier in April, six experts, including the, the expert on the right of development and on, and on um, contemporary forms of slavery. Um, also expressed deep concern at the fact that hundreds of thousands of Tibetans are reportedly transferred from traditional rural lives to low-skilled and low-paid employments in coerced um, labor schemes. And in February, other experts have expressed concern at the separation of up to one million children, um, Tibetan children, from their families. And of course, this was echoed during recent um, concluding observations, so the findings of UN committees that um, review China's obligation under treaty that it signed, so uh, the committees on economic, social, and cultural rights and on the elimination of discrimination against women. Um, I'm sure that my panelists, my fellow panelists will definitely delve into these issues um, in more detail, uh, but a last, of course, point to consider and to give more context is that China's um, UPR is coming in January, and of course, this discussion did not happen um, in a void. Um, so I'd first like to turn to you, Pema, uh, to give us a little bit of, a, of a, an overall context on the situation, and in particularly on the challenges that um, you know, Tibetan human rights defenders and more broadly the Tibetan people have faced in a region that is incre increasingly sorry, securitized. 
No. No. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you, Raf. And I also want to thank the Helsinki Foundation, FIDH, International Campaign for Tibet, and the Tibet Advocacy Coalition for bringing this event together. And thank you to Raf and ISHR for moderating the session. My name is Pema Doma, and I am a Tibetan human rights and climate activist. I am also the daughter of refugees and the executive director of Students for Free Tibet, an international chapter-based youth-led organization that works with students around the world, uh, and which is also a founding member of the Tibet Advocacy Coalition. I hope that my remarks today can help paint a more complete picture of the situation inside Tibet, more specifically to highlight how everything that makes Tibetans Tibetan, that makes me who I am and made my grandparents who they are, all of that, our unique identity and beautiful culture, which makes us inherently different from Chinese people as Tibetans, our language, our particular religious practices, our school of Buddhism, which informs everything from our core values to how we live our lives day to day. It affects how we connect with the environment, with other people, with animals, with the mountains and lakes of our indigenous homelands, with the rivers. All of that has now been marked for elimination by the Chinese government because it has been seen as different and it has fundamentally been seen as a potential threat to the power and long-term control of the Chinese Communist Party in Tibet. About six decades ago, my father was a small boy living in the capital of Tibet, the, city, the capital city of Tibet, when Chinese troops arrived. That day when he left his home with his mother with nothing but a clothes on his back, he didn't know that that would be the day, the world didn't know that that would be the day when Tibet would be drastically changed under CCP rule from what it had been for thousands of years. Till this day, the Chinese Communist Party does not have a legitimate rule inside Tibet, and Xi Jinping knows that. And that is precisely why the policies that we discuss today even exist because they seek to garner that legitimacy. Generation after generation of Tibetans have demonstrated that they are loyal first and foremost to the Dalai Lama and to other Buddhist leaders and to our Buddhist faith and to our Tibetan way of life because as Tibetans, like my father and millions of Tibetans inside Tibet, we do not see ourselves as Chinese. We see ourselves as Tibetan people. And while Tibetans have faced a varying degree of political and religious repression under Chinese rule, since Xi Jinping came to power in 2012, the repression has turned into a genocidal campaign carried out through comprehensive layers of policies, many of which we will discuss today. So today we are discussing key strands of this campaign, this campaign of repression, including forced relocation and coercive labor transfer programs along with colonial boarding schools with children as young as four and five years old, and the specific tools that the Chinese government uses to ensure that these policies are carried out with as little repression as possible, namely through all per pervasive online and offline surveillance, arbitrary detention, and enforced disappearances, which are specifically intended to send a message to the Tibetan people, a message of zero tolerance for dissent, and a message that they hope will strike fear in the hearts of every Tibetan who may consider even distinctly, vaguely consider the idea of pushing back against any of these policies. Inside Tibet today, enforced disappearance is the rule, not the exception. And this is something that UN experts noted in 2021 when they, stayed, when, when they stated there, and I quote, a worrying pattern of arbitrary and incommunicado detentions against the Tibetan religious minority, some of them amounting to enforced disappearances, end quote. One of the cases that the UN experts specifically raised was that of a Tibetan monk, intellectual, and community leader named Go Sherab Getso. Go Sherab Getso was held in police custody, unseen and unheard from the world for over three months before resurfacing over 2,000 kilometers away from where he had been detained in the capital of the Tibetan Autonomous Region, so-called, uh, which is known as Lhasa. On 3rd of February 2021, Gosher Abgetso was charged with this charge known as inciting secession. 
For 101 days after his detention, Goshar Abgetso had just disappeared from the face of the earth without his family, friends, or colleagues knowing anything about his health or well-being. And what was Gosher Abgetso's crime? Gosher Abgetso had written extensively on the issues, the exact issues we're discussing here today in this room of the United Nations, of forced cultural integration and the destruction of the Tibet, of Tibetan environment, language, and way of life. And Gosher Abgetso said, I quote, Pondering gen generally on the contemporary situation of the Tibetans, we are going through a cataclysm of forced cultural integration, both intentionally and unintentionally. In this thick climate of cultural assimilation, the environment and the people, language and culture, traditional customs and so forth are all subjected to acute destruction and decline. As a result, if we are to resist this historical situation based on individual passion, talent, or ability, we must leave no stone unturned in gaining control over the reins of our own future. There is nothing more important than that." End quote. In Tibet today, under the Chinese criminal procedure law, people accused of state security crimes are completely denied due process. They have no right to a lawyer. They have no right to an open trial. They can be kept for indefinite periods of time in detention, and they may also be kept in undisclosed location for interrogation because of the nature of the crime being categorized as state security related. The family of the accused does not have a right to be notified about their detention. In fact, under the Chinese criminal procedure law, even the family members of the accused may legally be kept under surveillance at their homes even before the accused has been found guilty of any crimes at all. Any of the so-called evidence collected by the CCP during the investigation process for criminal cases related to specifically crimes of state security as deemed by the Chinese government are kept completely secret, meaning that Tibetans that are accused often have little to no hope for future attempts to seek redress. In the past few years alone, Tibetans such as Jimtri, Hamu, Tenzin Nima, and Kunchuk Jimpa have all died in custody of the Chinese government. Their crimes, anything from circulating a climate-related petition, throwing leaflets in the air, or sending money to relatives in India, actions that probably any one of us or our children or our family members in this room today have all done ourselves. These are Tibetan people, human beings, their family members, children, parents. Many of them have faces that look just like mine here today. But right now, Hamu's children are orphans. And 19-year-old Tenzin Nima's parents are one of an unlucky few who have to endure the grief of outliving their own children. Xi Jinping's policies show that the changes to society in Tibet are a top priority of national interest for the CCP, of state security as deemed by the CCP, which therefore means that any action that goes against this so-called national interest can be deemed as a crime punishable. Therefore, any Tibetan who insists on speaking Tibetan language to their children instead of Chinese, any nomad who seeks to protect the environment and animals that they have coexisted with for millennia, any Tibetan who insists on continuing their way of life as a Tibetan suddenly becomes a threat to China's national interest and state security because of decisions they've taken on how they live their lives. At the core of it, that is the problem of this system and the policies that we will outline further today, created under Xi Jinping. There is no room for difference. And under Xi Jinping, what little morsels of freedom Tibetans that may have remained for Tibetans have now completely been eradicated. So thank you. That will be for now what I will share. Thank you so much, um, Pema, for giving us this pretty gloom, you know, overview of, of the current situation in a region that is um, that is put under very tight control in the name of, of national security or what is understood as national security. Um, now I'd like to turn to you, um, Gloria, so that you can uh, tell us a little bit more, you know, and, and flesh, us out, flesh out a little bit more for us, how does this, you know, assimilation happen in particular, you know, in, in, in the fields of, you know, culture, language, and religion, and, and in particular through this, I think, issue that has really epitomized this campaign, which is the residential boarding school system. 
Thank you, Raf. Uh, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank you for being here. Thank you to the organizers and co-sponsors of this event. So as Raf mentioned, I'd like to use the platform today to speak about the residential boarding school system um, that we're currently seeing in Tibet. I know that many of you in this room have been following this issue closely. Uh, it's been encouraging to see member states raise this issue in their item statements and during interactive dialogues um, during the Human Rights Council session, and that's something that we hope to see more of um, in the period forward. Um, we've also seen member states mobilizing on this issue nationally. So, for example, last month, the U.S. Department, uh, State Department announced a visa ban on Chinese officials for their involvement in the forcible assimilation of Tibetan children in these residential schools. Earlier this year, in April, the German government issued a statement in Parliament calling for the closure of these schools um, in Tibet. And in June, China, um, Canada's Parliamentary Subcommittee for International Human Rights recommended that China call on Ch um, recommended that Canada call on China to end this system and sanction Chinese officials responsible for its design and implementation. As, as Pema has mentioned, under Xi Jinping's leadership, the CCP has clearly marked um, Tibetan language and culture for eradication. Um, and they're very much using the colonial boarding school system as a vehicle to achieve this end. While the Chinese authorities um, have sought to expand local schools in China um, for those living in rural um, and remote areas, um, um, which was in line with the 2012 State Council decree. Um, the opposite is actually happening inside Tibet. So what we're seeing is that local schools are being closed down um, and rural options are increasingly being ruled out for Tibetan students. Today, more than 1 million Tibetan students between the ages of 4 and 18, approximately 80% of that population are currently separated from their families and in state-run boarding schools. This includes an estimated 100,000 to 150,000 four- and five-year-olds who are living in boarding preschools for at least five days a week. So four- and five-year-olds living five days a week in boarding preschools. In these schools, Tibetan children are required to study in Mandarin. They're not allowed to practice their religion, and they're subjected to a very politicized curriculum intended to make them identify as Chinese. And in that sense, the schools are very much geared towards trying to break the very fabric of Tibetan communities, remove a sense of Tibetanness from the new generation, and to produce a generation that does not speak Tibetan that does not have a Tibetan Buddhist identity and that does not feel a connection to their family and to their roots, but instead to the Chinese state. It's very much sinicization. The schools themselves, in terms of location, are often extremely far away from the, the children's homes. They can range between 300 and 1,500 kilometers away, which on a very practical level makes it extremely difficult for children to return home, if not impossible. Covering those distances on a weekend is, is near enough impossible. In one school in Cam, 80% uh, of Tibetan children do not return ho to their parents' home during the school year, even during holidays. And I think it's easy for all of us to imagine the great emotional distress that that can cause to any child, not being able to go home, see your parents, hug your parents. I mean, even, f even for us as adults, that's something that we all want to do. Um, and more so for children who want and need that support from their families. UN bodies themselves have raised the alarm on these schools, including earlier this year when the Committee on, um, on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights used very strong language in calling on China to immediately abolish these coercive residential schools, and they raised concerns regarding the sidelining of the Tibetan language. 
Uh, similarly, in May, uh, the Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women echoed these concerns, calling on China to abolish the schools and um, for China to reverse the closure of schools providing instruction in Tibetan language. At the end of 2022, we also saw this topic form the longest communication to date on Tibet by special procedures. China has responded with a range of justifications for these schools that we saw during the Siskar and SIDA reviews. Um, one was that they exist to cater to pastoral and mountainous populations. Um, and the other is that they, they are targeted towards students living in high altitude areas um, so that they're able to cope with altitude in lower areas, which is what they told the SIDA committee in May. Um, if these schools were about um, providing access and meeting needs, China would not be closing down local, rural, remote options at the same time that they're moving mass numbers of children into these residential boarding schools. It's clear from the residential boarding school systems we've seen against indigenous people, the precise reasoning that these systems are used, and it's very much about the elimination of a cultural and distinct identity. Beijing is feeling the mounting pressure at the international level, so much so that at the start of this month they actually organized a, UN, uh, a tour for uh, UN ambassadors uh, at the UN, a group of UN ambassadors which included China, Belarus, Pakistan, Nicaragua and Venezuela. Um, and the irony is that while China is opening up uh, these residential boarding schools for a certain group of allies, they're at the same time closing down access to human rights monitors and not cooperating with special procedures. Since 2018, China has permitted only one US, um, special rapporteur to visit the country, um, the special rapporteur on the rights of older persons who did not visit Tibet. And the last time a high commissioner was granted access to Tibet was in 1998. It's crucial that member states use um, this platform to further echo the voices of UN bodies, to amplify the strong language that's recently been used by the various committees in calling for, the, for, for China to immediately abolish the residential boarding schools. These efforts are needed nationally, bilaterally, but bilaterally and multilater uh, multilaterally as well, including by raising boarding schools at China's upcoming UPR um, in the form of recommendations, in the form of advanced questions, and in the form of mentions as well. I'm going to stop there, conscious of time, um, but look forward to engaging in Q&A. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gloria. I have to say it every time that I hear those numbers about the, the, the quantity of children, all ages, including at the earliest ages that are, that are you know, they're taking, you know, away from their families and away from their cultures is really astonishing if you also think about that they're a significant percentage of a whole population. Um, and, and I think you mentioned a key word here, which is this, this, this idea of cynicization, this idea um, that, um, and that's a policy that has been hailed by the government very recently um, by the president himself um, saying that religion should be cynicized. So this idea that um, there, there's no space for a different culture or religion if it's not you know, aligned with the main um, you know, Han Chinese culture. And that's of course a very worrying, a very worrying trend. Um, and, and, and that's an issue that the comedies have tackled. And as you said very well, um, we've had um, recommendations by UN treaty bodies, that is UN committees of experts that you know, look at China's obligations under a treaty that China ratified itself um, following a dialogue with the Chinese authorities, hearing from the Chinese authorities all the data that was presented and still the recommendation is clear, you have to close the boarding schools and you have to allow for Tibetan run private schools. Um, now I'd like to turn to another issue actually that was also of course raised in particular by the Committee on Economic, um, Social and Cultural Rights um, and, and turn to you Kai and I think you know very often in, uh, in, in the broader public opinion we, we know you know Tibet as, as the roof of the world as a very high altitude plateau. Um, it's also of course the world's third pole in terms of its, its, its um, largest reserves of fresh water outside of the pole so there's a significant um, role that Tibet plays you know in the, in, in the health of our planet. Um, and that Tibetans playing in maintaining in particular that environment um, and that they've been the four 
forefront, of course, of that protection. Um, so I wanted to you know, give you the floor to understand a little bit more what are the challenges that those that seek to protect that environment are facing right now in the region. Yeah, thank you very much, Raphael, and um, thank you also for FIDH and ISHR for co-sponsoring this event and for my uh, fellow panelists being here on the, on the panel. And uh, I, I indeed, I would like to speak about, um, you know, the Tibetan way of life, Tibetan nomadism, uh, rural, uh, the rural population of Tibet, uh, about Tibetan herders and about those who uh, engage in protecting the environment or the immediate uh, uh, local, you know, surroundings, if you will, the landscape uh, and uh, nature. And uh, um, if we speak about this, about Tibetan way of life, we need to speak about uh, the Tibetans in the rural areas, and that means we also need to speak about re the relocation policies, which have a tremendous impact on this way of life. And um, I would... Uh, like to place this issue in the context indeed of the sinicization policies. We've heard about um, two pillars, uh, if I may term it like that, two pillars of sinicization already, one of which is the education and language sector, where boarding schools have a tremendously negative impact on Tibetan culture. The second is um, religious freedom, re religious life in monasteries, um, the uh, self-organization of Tibetan Buddhism in terms of uh, the appointment of clergy where uh, the Chinese government quite drastically intervenes in the third pillar, uh, in our view, uh, constitutes um, the relocation policies because it uproots, uh, these policies uproot Tibetan life uh, to, to quite uh, dramatic uh, effect and also in terms of numbers. And uh, we have been screening Chinese government media uh, sources and according to which uh, uh, at least 1.8 million nomads, herders and rural dwellers in Tibet have been settled into sedentary houses under various Chinese government policies, one of which are environmentally labeled policies to protect um, the landscape, to protect the grassland, to uh, buy, for example, uh, taking Tibetans off the land by establishing nature reserves uh, in order to, to um, as it is called, um, implement a environmentally um, protective uh, policy on the Tibetan plateau. There are other labels for these policies, um, some of which are termed as policies to, um, to tackle poverty, others uh, to protect, uh, to uh, promote uh, development. While I've been stating 1.8 million as a, as a figure now, already in 2013, Human Rights Watch reported that since 1996, please allow this uh, travel back in time, uh, when uh, the Chinese government launched the campaign Build a New Socialist Countryside in Tibetan areas, between 06 and 12, over 2 million Tibetans, uh, two-thirds of the entire population of the Tibet Autonomous Region, had been rehoused, and hundreds of thousands of nomadic herders had been relocated and settled in so-called new socialist villages. Uh, Human Rights Watch at the time reported that in areas of relocation, displaced Tibetans have not received compensation or assurances of income or employment for the future. These resettlement or relocation programs continue. For example, Chinese state media reported in 22 last year that uh, some 17,000 people would be relocated from the village of Tsonyi to Simburi. Um, in, the, in the middle of Tibet, uh, from the middle of Tibet to southern Tibet by the end of August 22. This is part, uh, the state media reported at the time, of a larger plan to relocate 130,000 Tibetans by 2025 under the so-called Very High Altitude Relocation Program. In the recent SESCA review, the Chinese delegation stated that by 
2019, under a so-called poverty alleviation program, the Chinese authorities had relocated some 260,000 people. Most had been living at particular high elevations, the delegation stated. As this figure may only refer to programs implemented in a Tibet autonomous region pertaining solely to one particular resettlement and relocation program, and as the Chinese authorities applying additional resettlement programs under different labels, labels in Tibetan areas outside the TAR, the figure stated at the beginning of my presentation, significantly more than one million Tibetans and most likely close to or above two million affected Tibetans appears high highly plausible. This underscores the magnitude and impact of these programs. While China argues it achieved 100% voluntary relocation, research with pastoralists either resettled or due to be resettled to the Tibetan area around Nakshu in central Tibet, found that families were coerced into resettling through the withdrawal of government services, dedicated communal and individual thought work, another word for indoctrination, and the offer of financial incentives and threats of punishments. It should be noted that the absence of an independent judicial system and lack of access to justice and overall the implementation of elements of totalitarian rule in Tibet by the Chinese authorities have led to a pervasive climate of fear that per se precludes the assumption of free, prior, and informed consent given by those affected by state measures. State measures, measures such as relocation programs, as I just described them, which have a significant impact on an individual's personal life and which are implemented in a pervasive climate of fear, should therefore be viewed as coercive and discriminatory and as an infringement of rights according to the UDHR and other codified international right standards. Again, given the scale and impact of these programs and given the absence of principles of rule of law and an independent judiciary, the relocation programs of the Chinese authorities rep represent a drastic intervention into Tibetan society, effectively turning Tibetan lives upside down, uprooting them without the chance to meaningfully have their say. China should. We are asking, we're urging the Chinese government to pursue development and environmental policies that respect the economic, social, and cultural rights of Tibetans and which are inclusive of local populations in line with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, particularly SDG 16, which calls for just and inclusive societies. The Chinese government should halt relocation policies in the Tibet autonomous region and in Tibetan areas outside the TRR. With regard to environmental policies, the Chinese government should respect principles of equal treatment, community participation, information transparency, freedom of speech, and fair treatment of local communities, and respect principles of free and prior and informed consent. It should enact laws that provide for safeguarding these principles and that provides for access to justice, including remedy, redress, and compensation, review, and amend existing laws that disregard principles of free, prior, and informed consent. And most of all, the Chinese government should provide for access to justice with an independent judiciary for individuals subjected to relocation programs. On the other hand, while I'm presenting, have presented a top-down approach to policy, there are Tibetans indeed who try to change on a local level to make a difference, who try to, from a bottom-up perspective in their local communities, try to, uh, try to uh, protect the environment, who protest, who are quite courageously um, uh, engaging themselves with their local environment and community. Last month, UN human rights experts have called on the Chinese government to provide information about nine Tibetans imprisoned for their peaceful efforts to protect Tibet's environment. 
which is crucial to the entire region. In the statement, the three experts, the Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights Defenders, the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Assembly and Association, and the Special Rapporteur on Human Rights Obligations relating to the enjoyment of a safe, clean, healthy, and sustainable environment, admonished the Chinese government to provide details about the reason for detention and the health condition of nine Tibetans, all of whom were detained between 2010 and 2019. While I'm looking at the clock, I'd like to cut this part uh, short uh, and uh, just refer to a report the International Campaign for Tibet has published in 2022, in which we, the organization ICT documented 50 known cases of Tibetans arbitrarily detained, arrested, tried, or sentenced since 28. We would like to urge the Chinese government to effectively address threats, attacks, har harassment, and intimidation against human rights defenders by government authorities and private corporations, including by thoroughly, promptly, and independently investigating human rights violations and abuses against them, bringing the perpetrators to justice in fair trials, and providing effective remedies and adequate uh, reparation to the victims. It is important to, to name, to highlight individual cases. We have urged consistently to, to governments to raise these names in any statement states are making here at the Human Rights Council and beyond, uh, one of uh, whom, one of those persons, individuals, is the Tibetan Anya Sengra, who has been also um, uh, featured, if you will, by uh, UN Independent Experts Committee communications, it is important to, to also, particular during the UPR process, to highlight these individual cases. And with that, I close. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kai, and um, I would like to highlight one, one thing from your intervention that for me is very clear is that I think in Geneva we have a tendency to silo human rights issues, and we don't see how they are deeply, you know, connected to other, you know, structural um, problems, and, uh, and I think, you know, your intervention highlights those, how, you know, the lack of rule of law and the lack of judicial independence, you know, further fuel violations, how this is connected to development, how this is connected to environmental protection, the fight against climate change, how this is connected to the achievement or not of the sustainable development goals um, by, by the PRC and more broadly, um, of course. Um, so thank you for this. Um, before, I, I have a, one question that I do want to pose, but before posing that question, I would like to actually um, give the floor to the audience here um, to, uh, for, for very brief interventions or, or questions to our panelists um, today. Um, given, of course, time limits, as you know, I would like to ask um, kindly that in questions are limited to um, to two minutes, um, and that if you don't have a uh, country nameplate, if you can identify yourself and your affiliation. Um, and first, I recognize Your Excellency, the Ambassador of Canada. Your Excellency, you have the floor. So thanks very much, Raphael. And I just wanted to um, thank the panelists for your very important and courageous uh, interventions and presentations, uh, which hopefully and no doubt will help keep uh, Tibet at the forefront of the discussions at the HRC as well as in other multi Fora. I wanted to echo concerns expressed by, by you here today um, and also as detailed recently uh, by treaty body reviews and communications of special procedures, which all of you mentioned, uh, regarding uh, discriminatory policies used in Tibet that attempt to eradicate Tibetan culture uh, and language. Um, China's assimilation policies and boarding school systems in Tibet, as spoken about quite extensively by Gloria, so thank you for that, uh, really is a grave concern. Uh, uh, we see it as a very grave concern, and it's really important that we continue to speak up against such repressive policies and regressive policies. Um, while humbly, of course, recognizing my own country uh, has had to reckon with uh, the painful past of residential schools, and we continue to do so uh, very actively, we're also in a very unique position to recognize that such policies run counter to the promotion and protection of economic, social, and cultural rights. Uh, 
as well as erode the richness that can benefit societies from cultural uh, preservation. Uh, and I do have a question uh, for the panelists. Um, you did mention the backdrop of the upcoming uh, UPR. Uh, this is a, a process of great importance to Canada, and it's a great opportunity for constructive dialogue with other states. So I'm really interested uh, with the, the broad range of issues that all of you put on the table, what you would consider to be the most important recommendations that council members uh, can make, again, as I mentioned, on the many, many issues you raised uh, and outlined here today. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador. I'm just going to take two more interventions. Uh, so the gentleman over here and lady over there. Two minutes, please, and please state your affiliation and name. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry, I can't use Tibetan to down to my one minute. Okay. Uh yeah, yeah. Thank you to all the panelists for sharing. Um, I had two questions. So the first one is, um, I well, first of all, I recognize a lot of the um, statements by saying that people are secessionist in theocracies. Um, and I noted that this year uh, China have ra has ratified the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Um, so I was wondering how an Article 14 clearly guarantees the freedom of thought, conscience, and religion and belief for children. And we've seen same patterns also, uh, like Christian children or anyone under 18 is not allowed to enter a church. They've arrested Sunday school teachers. They've prevented children from even entering, entering uh, church buildings. And I think uh, even worse in the Tibetan areas as well. So how can states or civil society engage um, on the Convention on the Rights of the Child? Or would the, just the last session had actually a representative from the UN Committee on the Rights of the 
child. So how can we engage with them? And then uh, secondly, um, China is up for election at the Human Rights Council. And I noted that in 2020, they pledged the full protection of the rights of special groups. And this is quoted, they said, China will prior prioritize the development of ethnic minorities and ethnic minority areas, respecting and protecting the rights of ethnic minorities. And then further, they also um, said that they would protect uh, citizens' civil and political rights in accordance with the law. Um, so how would you see, how have they lived up to these pledges, and um, what do they need to do to, to fulfill these pledges? And also, what are your thoughts on them uh, applying for re-election? Uh, what should, what can states, because as, as I, as we as I see, they have not lived up to these pledges. So why, what, what right, or how can they even have the <laughs> to reapply for the Human Rights Council? Because it, it really does delegitimize the efforts um, made here to promote the Article 18, 19 and in the CRC Article 14, 20, and 30. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'll take first these three interventions because I know that we're running a little bit out of time and hopefully we can have uh, uh, the time for another another round. Um, so just recalling perhaps the questions regarding um, the elections. So I'm getting back uh, in time, but like uh, the elections, how can the civil society engage with the Committee on the Rights of the Child, um, considering that China actually just submitted their report. So the reporting um, process is triggered and uh, the question posed by the ambassador with regards to the UPR and um, perhaps recommendations or advanced questions uh, that you'd like um, states to be raising in that context. Um, I'll start with you, Gloria, and then we can go this. If you can keep it to maximum two minutes so we can perhaps have a second round. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the questions. Um, I'll start with um, Ambassador. Um, so on the question of recommendations to China, um, so from the perspective of the residential schools, it would be very much um, echoing, um, calling on China to implement the recommendations that have come come out of the concluding observations of CISCAR and CEDA, um, including that it immediately abolish the schools and reverse the closure of local schools, um, not just that, but also subsidizing schools, Tibetan schools going forward. Um, I think an issue that generally speaks to all of these issues that we're talking about um, is one of access. Um, you know, y special procedures hasn't had access for an extremely long period of time. When access access is granted, it's often not granted to Tibet. When the access is granted, what does it mean? Is it really unfettered? Is it meaningful? We haven't seen that take place. So I think it's for being really strong in calling for meaningful, unfettered access for human rights monitors, for special procedures, and for the High Commissioner. Obviously, we were very um, disheartened to see that, you know, the former High Commissioner didn't visit Tibet and it wasn't on, on the agenda as such. Um, so from that end, pushing there. And then I think as well, well, um, a huge issue generally when it comes to um, cultural rights is the preservation of Tibetan language. Um, shall I address some of the other questions in the same yeah, go? Briefly. Yeah. So, um, other question wise, um, thank you for, for, for the intervention as well. Um, in terms of mention that it's the best way to guarantee the rights of um, farmers, uh, children of farmers to access to education, um, I would say, you know, again, the, the, the narrative being that these are quite uh, remote areas. Um, I would bring up a number of cases. One, if it's just for uh, mountainous populations, then why are children in Latin? with families in Lhasa attending boarding schools in Lhasa. Um, there are local options available. Why are they being closed down? Um, that brings up the general other issue of why are local schools in these areas being closed at such a rate? Um, because if it's a question of there being no schools, but it's closing schools that do already exist. Um, and then the last thing I would just say on that is when it's about guaranteeing rights. If it is about guaranteeing rights, then let in UN experts uh, show the ways in which these are guaranteed, allow genuine um, uh, independent access to these educational facilities um, in a way that would showcase that. Um, very quickly on the Committee on the Rights of the Child, yes, uh, there's a really great report by Tibet Action Institute which has raised many of the concerns that are set out in relation to violations there. The one main big one as well is that guaranteeing the right of parents to choose the education of their children. 
in conformity with their own um, moral um, principles and religious principles. Um, China is overdue uh, on its reporting to the committee. Um, again, states pressing China and uh, the UN system pressing China to adhere to its reporting obligations. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Gloria. Um, the gentleman did leave, but he wanted to comment about his ability to speak Tibetan and his time living in my father's childhood area, which um, obviously it doesn't make you feel happy to hear this, your own language being used against you in a way like that in such a public and critical forum that you've traveled uh, hundreds of miles to be at. But if he had stayed, I would have said that I think it's great that he speaks Tibetan, and I just hope the next generation can as well. And under these colonial boarding schools, there's no guarantee. In fact, it's almost a guarantee otherwise. So I, I hope that... Um, so I would like to continue with the recommendations that um, the first one that I would like to raise is that it's not a question of whether there was torture. There was torture in the case of a 19-year-old Tibetan monk named Tenzing Nyema who was detained and later found with his legs broken in a, in, a, in a hospital bed and passed away at the age of 19. There was torture in the case of Kunchok Jimpa who was an environmentalist, environmental defender who was uh, tortured for his act of sharing information about attractive and exploitive mining policies and practices inside Tibet when he ended up with a brain hemorrhage directly from a prison and he died in a hospital bed. There is not questions of whether there is torture or there is not. This is a known fact and, and therefore um, in the opportunities where there are advanced questions or at any point along the process, there must be accountability for these acts of torture. There must be accountability for deaths in custody. Otherwise, it sends a very strong message to China that if somebody stands for a policy against a policy of the Chinese government, torture and uh, even murder are acceptable and the international community will, will not directly ask them about these types of questions. They will not have to hear the names of these people that they have tortured to death um, in the halls of the UN or otherwise, and also mentioning the human rights defenders who are still alive, such as Anya Sengda, who's currently serving a seven-year sentence uh, for his act of uh, environmental defense. Um, his brother, Jim Three, has already died in custody, and he is alive now, but uh, without the support of the international community, there is no knowing whether he will make it alive from his seven-year sentence. And also in the case of Gosher Abgetso, whom I mentioned earlier, who was taken from his home, uh, his home region. He had gone for a medical checkup and suddenly I would even use the word as kidnapping. He was detained and removed 2,000 miles away into the Tibetan Autonomous Region, so-called by the Chinese government. He was arrested in the Tibetan Autonomous Prefectures, and he was taken forcibly into the region where there are a stronger um, code of uh, against state security and charged there in that region. So these are the names of Gosher Abgetso and Anya Sengda, as well as uh, any country that takes and separates four- and five-year-olds from their families least for any reason, no matter what the justification, there is none that exists. Anyone who's had a four-year-old in their family uh, would know that. So, yeah. Yes, I'll try. I would like to, I think, stress um, for states who wish to raise China at the UPR to understand all of these policies that we've uh, uh, referred to today as part of one larger um, systematic approach, uh, namely the sinicization policy. And we would urge or suggest go uh, governments and states to raise religious freedom issues, to raise education, language, and to raise way of life, relocation, and reset settlement issues and to trace them as a dramatic um, a dramatic impact or their, their impacts as, as being a dramatic intervention into Tibetan culture and Tibetan culture rights, which is uh, quite uh, fundamental and existential, if you will. So this would be uh, my brief suggestion.
Thank you so much, and this allows us to finish on time. I'll just perhaps just suffer a one-minute wrap if I'm allowed. Um, just, just flag that, and I apologize, we'll not be able to have another round of, of, uh, of uh, questions, but uh, that I'm, I'm really glad that our panelists could come today to really show us how, you know, what are the policies behind uh, the, the restrictions to the intergenerational transmission of a culture, religion, um, and of a language that is through tackling, you know, the transmission of those in family, um, in society, and in school. So the main circles where those things are transmitted. And I'll just end here by, by reflecting on the question around the elections. And of course, um, China is running again, uh, again at the Human Rights Council. Um, she, um, we know uh, that this is not a candidacy that should be um, put up there. My organization, as well as other organizations, oppose China's candidacy to the Human Rights Council. 